Hello, everybody, and welcome to uh, our final Theology on Tap for the month of uh, May, where we've been talking about Mary. Mary is the new Eve. Mary is the Ark of the Covenant. Mary is Queen of Heaven. And today, one of the ones that is tough for people is Mary, ever virgin. Uh, it's, if you ever see the icon of her Blessed Lady, usually done in the East, you'll notice on the icon she has a star on this shoulder, a star on her veil, and a star in this shoulder. And that is the representation of Mary Virgin before, during, and after the birth of our Lord. What the heck is this all about? Is the Catholic Church obsessed about sex? Catholic Church is obsessed about love. And so we're going to talk about that. But let's begin with a prayer and ask our Blessed Lady to intercede on our behalf. Because if you remember from last week, uh, the king never refuses anything the queen mother asks, right? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so we pray together. Hail, Holy Queen, Mother of Mercy, our life, our sweetness, and our hope. To thee do we cry, poor banished children of Eve. To thee do we send up our sighs, mourning and weeping in this valley of tears. Turn then, most gracious advocate, then eyes of mercy toward us. And after this, our exile, Show unto us the blessed fruit of thy womb, Jesus. O clement, O loving, O sweet Virgin Mary, pray for us, O Holy Mother of God, that we may be made worthy of the promises of Christ. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is the Salve Regina. I think it goes back to the 11th century, which came out of the monastery, where uh, in, uh, especially in the Middle Ages, uh, developing much of what we've been talking about, which goes back to the fathers of the church. And so why is it that uh, the church defends the perpetual virginity of Mary? Because, you know, if you've ever talked to evangelicals, one of the things they always want to suggest to you is the place where it talks about Jesus having brothers um, or uh, that it says that Joseph didn't know Mary until they were, you know, that Jesus was born, then after that. Uh, but, you know, the, the thing about it is to think about, first of all, what's really at stake when we talk about the celibacy, not the celibacy, but the perpetual virginity of Mary and the celibacy of her son. You know, I'm a celibate. There's a reason why in the Western church, uh, we have celibate diocesan priests and celibate religious. It's not so in every Catholic um, rite. You know, there are, I think it's 22 or 25 different uh, liturgical rites that are in communion with, uh, with Rome, with the Holy Father. We are the Latin rite, um, and the Latin rite obviously is rooted in the rite as it developed in Rome around the fourth century, I think because mostly in the first several centuries of the church history, even we in the West, we prayed in Greek. It's why at Mass, we still say Kyrie eleison, Christe eleison, Kyrie eleison. That's not Latin, that's Greek, and that's the original language we all prayed in. But in those 25 rites, there's the Orthodox, the Ruthenian, there's the Russians, there's the Ukrainians, the Malabar rite, there's a bunch of them. Um, and they all, uh, they all pray in their own vernacular, although some of it is pretty ossified, I think. You know, they, the, the liturgy hasn't developed in some of those rites in the same way that, that it has in the West. But that the point of all of this is, is that in some of those rites, the diocesan priests, like myself, are permitted to marry. They will ordain a married man, but they won't generally allow an ordained man to marry. But religious life is different in both the West and the East. So for instance, even in the East, uh, the monks are uh, celibate and, and chaste, just as the religious are in the West. That's been the rock solid part of celibacy in our Christian her in heritage. And in fact, in the Eastern Orthodox and the others, um, the um, the bishops are all chosen from the monastic orders. Uh, Mary diocesan priests are never made bishops in, uh, in the Eastern Rites. So why the commitment to celibacy? Because it's pretty ancient in our tradition. 
And this is the thing about celibacy, and it goes back to Jesus. And remember, Jesus wasn't a, was a celibate and lived chastely. It's because what Je the, Jesus' mission was to preach the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is not about this world. This world will end. The kingdom of God does not end. And you know, he talked about marriage. He said, the men and women of this age are married, married and given in marriage. But in the age to come, we'll live like angels. Uh, what exactly that means is probably immortal. Um, we'll have bodies because Jesus told us we would have bodies. That's what the whole point of the resurrection and Easter is and, and Mary's assumption into heaven, right, is all about the bodily resurrection. But that his celibate life was a prophecy about the world to come. And remember the, the one theological point the church has followed through for 2,000 years very consistently, and still to this day, is that what you say about Mary is points to who Jesus is. And so as, if Jesus is a celibate, Mary is not a celibate, she's married. But in that marriage, she does not have sexual relations with Joseph, her husband. Um, and there are indications of that in Scripture, and it, she was not alone, apparently, uh, in that practice. So we're going to talk about that tonight. So first, what's the evidence in Scripture of Mary ever virgin? And so I don't know, but uh, last week we talked about my posting um, scriptural resources on Facebook, so you have a chance to, to look at these sites, even if you don't didn't have a chance to look at it before we started up tonight. Um, yep, I got my little timer going so I don't go too long. Uh, but the, uh, the scriptural resources have the major text we'll be talking about tonight. And so the first one that I wanted to talk about is the Gospel of Luke. And if you remember the Gospel of Luke, and what's important about the Gospel of Luke, is that it really tells the story of the birth of Jesus from Mary's perspective. It's in the Gospel of Luke that the angel appears to Mary. Mary goes to see Elizabeth. It's all about um, Mary's perspective. Matthew is the same story, but told from St. Joseph's perspective. Uh, it's really interesting that the gospel evangelists um, approach the story that way, because the stories match up very well if you understand what you're reading. So here's the angel. Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son. And she'll call his name Jesus. There's a lot, of pa lot packed in these verses because it, this is, says a lot about who Mary is. The angel says, He'll be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. Now this is the, this is the money text. And Mary said to the angel, How can this be since I have no husband? And the angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Now, this is the thing. She says she has no husband, but she's betrothed. That is legally married. What it, she's saying is, I haven't had sex with my husband. And in, you read Matthew, which tells the other side of it. It says, Joseph does not have sex with her. The point of both of these texts is, A, that there was no natural generation of Jesus prior to his birth. So when you talk to evangelicals especially, um, they, they say, well, then afterwards they lived like husband and wife because she has these, these other children. We're going to talk about the other children in a minute. But the point is, is no, they didn't, and the scriptures are pretty clear about it. And so we'll turn to Matthew. That was the first chapter of Luke I was in, and the citation's right there. But the second one is the first chapter of Matthew, so it's pretty easy to remember where all this is. And so this is Joseph, and he has a dream. But he's, as he can, uh, Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with a ch child by the Holy Spirit. So betrothed for them is marriage. Um, probably, maybe you've heard the, the, the story. It kind of died in the 50s. 
But have you ever heard of breach of promise cases, lawsuits where two people were engaged and someone tried to bail out in the engagement so the other person was able to sue them? Because in the old days, marriage was very much about the financial advantages that joining two families together would provide to the, to the couple. And so a lawsuit, you actually had a right of action to recover damages for the, lack, uh, for the lost union. Um, that went away in the 20th century, started to die because marriage became just about love and nobody ever worried about you know, whether or not there was uh, any financial advantage to anybody getting married. Past generations were not as um, tender about that as we are. Um, and probably it's one of the reasons why their marriages endured longer than, than the marriages of our generation. But I digress. So we'll keep moving. So before they came together, she was found to be with a child by the Holy Spirit. And her husband, Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to send her away quietly. But as he considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. So, first, and I always think this was the thing that uh, impressed me, is he believes that she is pregnant because of the power of God. He is a just man, a very righteous man. The idea that somehow... He would think, okay, well, as soon as this is over, I guess it'll, it'll be just on. You know, like, it's, this is what it's supposed to be. That is not who these people are. If you believe that your wife was a vessel of the Holy Spirit when she gave birth and had no intervention by any male, that is a supernatural event. And the people in the first century were not as callous about those things as we are. But let's go on. And so, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take your wife, for what is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, she will call him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. That's what the name Yeshua means, uh, God saves. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord has spoken by the prophet. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and his name shall be called Emmanuel, which I believe is from Isaiah, which means God is with us. Then, this is the key text. It's uh, verse 24 of the first chapter of Matthew. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had borne a son, and he called his name Jesus. Now, the way that evangelicals will interpret that, until he bore a son, which I think is, if you watch Dr. Petrie's great lecture on this, um, the eos, the Greek word means until. But... Um, it doesn't mean until in the sense that afterwards things changed. In fact, the same word is used at the end of the Gospel of Matthew, which everybody should remember how the Gospel of Matthew ends. Jesus is about to send. We just had this this last weekend. Go therefore, he says to his disciples, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That's why we baptize teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the close of the age. Okay, so does that mean after the age closes, Jesus won't be with us anymore? No, that's not what it means. It means he will be, he will be with you to the end of time. And so with Jesus, with St. Joseph, it doesn't mean until it says he took her as, until Jesus' birth, doesn't mean that they started having conjugal relations. What it means is, is that in that in-between period, uh, when, before, during Mary's pregnancy, that they never had sexual relations. And so that leaves scripture scholars to wonder, uh, because evangelical some will say, although a lot of Protestants, um, scholars, according to Dr. Petrie, now agree that, that this is exactly what these texts mean. And this is, this is the teaching of the early church, and they're from the culture, they know exactly what it means. Um, but they point to the Old Testament where a woman can take a vow to deny herself. And they're obviously talking about sexual relations with her husband. And what it says, and I'll point to it, it's Numbers chapter 30, is that if the husband or the father doesn't prevent her from doing it, then it will stand. So it works like this if you read through chapter 30. If the young girl says, I don't want to have a husband, I don't want to have children, this is how I want to live my life, um, 
she will get her way unless her husband or, or father uh, will not agree to it. And so apparently there was a law in, in the Old Testament that allowed it because uh, some women just didn't want to go through childbearing. I mean, there's a lot of reasons for this. There was a group called the Therapeutai, which Dr. Petrie uh, had referred to, in Egypt in the first century that took vows of celibacy. Vows of celibacy is uh, what drew the monks into the desert, like St. Anthony of the Desert in the uh, fourth, uh, the third century, in the mid-200s, one of the, the seminal um, figures in monastic tradition. But the reason that they're celibate is because of the example of Joseph and Mary. There's another Mary of Egypt who was a, an anchoress, a nun in Egypt. And it's where our tradition of celibacy comes from, rooted in the understanding of what's there in Luke and Matthew. But this is the reading from chapter 30. And here's the part I was referring to, and it starts in chapter 30, verse 13. Any vow and any binding oath to afflict herself. By the way, now uh, your wife has something new to refer to as afflicting myself, which is the promise that she will not engage in conjugal relations with anybody. So any vow and any binding oath to afflict herself, her husband may establish or her husband may make void. So husband can agree or disagree with it. But if her husband says nothing to her from day to day, then he establishes all her vows or all her pledges that are upon her. He has established them because he said nothing to her on the day that he heard of them. Um, well, St. Joseph didn't do anything. And so these two are righteous people under the law. And apparently Mary had taken a vow. That's at least the rationale behind it. And it wasn't unheard of in the Israel of her day. You've heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Essenes down by the Dead Sea in Qumran. Um, there was a whole uh, group there that took vows of celibacy for the reasons that Jesus talks about. It points to a world to come, that there is something inadequate. And remember how we started out this series of classes in the very first class three weeks ago, four weeks ago, whatever it was. Uh, we talked about the ladder of love, that the idea is that just pursuing um, the concupiscence, um, the, the sense of love reduced merely to this world, a uh, dead ends in death, if not before. But that love directed towards the source of love has the ability to transcend. And that is what the Christian sees on in interpreting the scriptures. Because the monastic tradition, which uh, takes the example in scripture, puts it together with what the Greeks were already talking about, about the ladder of love. It's how the, the life of per perfection is pursued. And it still is what um, enthuses and attracts people to religious life. You know, it's what I kind of picked up on when I read St. Traz of Lazou's book back in my 30s, that all of this goes someplace. But the place that it goes is where Jesus and Mary lead. Um, whether you look at Jesus the new Moses and Mary the Ark of the Covenant, together, the, their witness of their lives is that this world is not everything. Now, for most of my parishioners, um, marriage becomes the way that they pursue sanctity. But the reason marriage works for Christians is because it becomes something more than about making your 16-year-old dreams come true. Love develops over marriage. And I think when you have children and you age together and you have so many happy things to share, so many sad things to share, that um, uh, it changes how you think about love and deepens how you think about love. And parishioner after parishioner, I think, is a testimony to that. People always have problems because nobody gets the weight of sin. Our intentions are terrific, but we have to deal with the baggage that we have, uh, which is how we're built as human beings. And that transformation takes time. But it starts with just the recognition that the things of this world fade away and that the life of Jesus and Mary points to something. So why is it, before I go on to this, cheers.
I should do commercials and see if I can get a sponsorship from some California winery. Probably the Italians would sponsor me. Gallo or something. But what I wanted to say was, do you remember the book, The Da Vinci Code, Dr. Petrie talked about? If you get a chance, sign up and watch that lecture. It's really good. The, the idea that Jesus and Mary Magdalene, they did it. Because you know why? They couldn't have been happy with that without doing it. There was, if you ever get the chance, and you like Bruce Springsteen, look up his song, which is on YouTube for free, called Jesus Was an Only Son. It's a great tune. I mean, Springsteen, there's more to going on Springsteen than just being a mindless rocker. That's, that guy's got a great view on life. But Jesus is an Only Son is about Jesus, Mary, it's about Jesus' crucifixion. And at one point, he starts to think, you know, maybe, maybe it would be nice. Uh, just get Mary Magdalene, get a little bar out on the Dead Sea, something like that. It was a crazy, it was a crazy lyric. But the, the idea is that he could make other choices. Well, yeah, because that's freedom is having choices, right? Real freedom is choosing God, because every other choice will enslave you somehow. And so, did Jesus and Mary Magdalene date? No, not seriously or otherwise, because Jesus was like a bullet on target, and the target was the kingdom of God and the salvation of people. And his celibate commitment um, was part of that. And his mom uh, was simply the vessel that God chose to bring him into the world. But she was prepared. That's why I like that thing. That this is how I thought about this before I ever um, listened to Dr. Petrie. And St. Joseph is a just man, a very devout man. An angel comes to a dream and tells him, your wife is pregnant by the Holy Spirit. This guy is not thinking the way that uh, people in this culture think. And so to understand the celibacy of Mary is a big deal. Now, here's the second thing. Do you remember the part about, um, let me check our time. Oh, got seven minutes, easy. So you remember the part where it said in Scripture that Jesus' brothers, um, um, Jesus, uh, Mary came with Jesus' brothers. Well, if you draw together the dots on all of that, because uh, it gives the names of those two guys who are, um, let's see if I can find it here in my notes. Um, oh, James and Joseph and Salome. There were, and these are, um, these are the, uh, the brothers of Jesus. But what Dr. Petrie points out, and I'd heard this before, he does such a good job with it, but it's, it's the problem of just taking Scripture and strip-quoting it, because the way to read Scripture is a book at a time. You don't try to play biblical bingo where you take one line out of one Scripture and another line out of another Scripture. You take it and you understand what the story is. Like Luke is told uh, about Jesus' birth from Mary's perspective, Matthew, tells it from Joseph's perspective, but it's uh, two uh, parallel traditions that establish the same fact, that, Mary, that Jesus is not generated by any human action. Um, why they would say that if it wasn't true is crazy, because in the ancient world it just comes with all sorts of baggage. Um, but for them it's very different. It's not Zeus comes down from heaven, finds a good-looking uh, daughter of a king, and decides he wants to have a baby named Hercules with him. Um, the story that the, the Gospels tell is very different. And it's the God who says, let there be light, um, just creates, gives life by his word. So he sends his word into the world that says, um, this is my body, this is my blood. That is God making something by, by saying it. And so the, to get back to the little digress in there, but to get back to... Um, to the question about who these brothers were, what Dr. Petrie points us to is, first of all, the uh, Mark 15, 37 to 40, and that's the crucifixion. And so here's what it says um, in uh, the Gospel of Mark. Um, 
And Jesus uttered a loud cry. Am I at the right thing? Because that doesn't look like it. 37, 40 to 41. Okay. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that he thus breathed his last, he said, Truly this man was the Son of God. Here's the money text. There were also women looking on from afar, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James the Younger and of Joseph and Salome, who when he was in Galilee followed him and ministered to him, and also many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. So if it was his mother, it would have said Mary his mother. But that's not what it says. It says Mary, the mother of James, the younger, and of Joseph and Solomon. And then if you go to Matthew 27, 61, which is basically the same story but told by Matthew. I think these, these, the evangelists just didn't anticipate these kinds of objections because they knew the story and were just telling it. Um, see, they needed more lawyers writing this. They didn't have been more careful the words they chose. But in Matthew 27, 61... It says, let me see if I can find this here. And so uh, they put him in a clean linen shroud and laid it in his new tomb. This is his burial, which he had hewn in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the door of the tomb and departed. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there sitting opposite the tomb. Do you think they just refer to Mary, the blessed lady, as the other Mary? Well, who's the first one? Well, the first one's the blessed virgin. So this other Mary who, as it turns out, if you go on through the scriptures, is the wife of Clopas. If you look in Luke, which is the road to Emmaus, Clopas is Jesus' uncle. And he's the one that Jesus, uh, that Jesus approaches on the road to Emmaus as they're fleeing Jerusalem. You always read that on the, I think it's the second Sunday of Easter we had that. But it says that Mary and Clopas were husband and wife. So that's what it means to be, uh, that these were his brothers. Adelphoi can mean brother, it can also mean cousin. There is another word that also means cousin. But if you look at the early Christian historians, Eusebius of Caesarea wrote the history of the church. Another Christian historian named, named, uh, uh, named Hegesippus, I think, they both refer to James and Joseph as uh, bishops. James was the first bishop of Jerusalem. Um, after Peter and John and the rest moved on to preach the word, James stayed in Jerusalem, was martyred, and Joseph, his brother, followed. They were both cousins of the Lord, the Adelphoi of the Lord. So uh, it's why you read with the church and you read with the tradition, uh, the tradition of the church, but that the idea of Mary's being ever virgin before, during, and after is rooted in scripture, but there is a reason for it, just like everything else we've talked about, uh, Mary, that all of this points to the kingdom of heaven. You know, the tendency is in the modern age, I think, um, to try to, um, to make everything compatible with how Americans want to live their life anyway, and to dumb down the scriptures. But the scriptures is a challenge to how we, how we live our lives, and especially to the sexual ethic in America. And there is a reason, I think, that people get so um, dissatisfied with marriage, and it's too bad. Uh, we've kind of done it to ourselves. I don't know if you read that both the rate of marriage and the birth rate are at like 35-year lows. What is that all about? Uh, there is clearly something stressing our young people. I mean, if this if you were going to go off and Game and Fish went up there and told you that the, the uh, bighorn deer and the, and the bighorn uh, sheep and the deer and the animals up on the Catalina Mountains were not reproducing, it would cause an uproar um, that humans aren't reproducing. It goes without apparently much concern in our, in our uh, human environment. We create a toxic environment, in my estimation, in America. And if it's an environment that's directed towards... Uh, just pleasure. You know, it just, uh, other people have thought longer and more deeply about this than us. And I think what the Catholic faith opens you up to is at least a challenge to that cultural um, 
mindset, that default setting that you've got to somehow make yourself happy. Um, well, we have come to kind of the end of our time, so I'm going to sum up. You can go and read those for yourself. They're right there on Facebook. But, uh, you know, prayer, um, why it is that you just get used to your emotions go up and down, and that if you can just hold strong through the down periods and whatever vacation, whether it's the priesthood or marriage or the single life when you're waiting for the right person to marry who hopefully shares your faith or at least supports you in your faith, that this is all about some bigger goal um, than what's going to make me happy in the next 15 minutes. You know, um, happiness, unhappiness, these are human emotions. And we all have those emotions. It's what builds character and depth in us. And so I'm going to go through a couple of the little comments here that you all read, but they're about this big on my little screen. Harold McCadden and Mrs. McCadden, God bless you. Good to see you. Catherine, hope you're enjoying Oregon. Uh, I don't even know what protocon is. I think the word was, uh, look at Dr. Petrie's uh, book or in his, you get the lectures for free, Harold, if you just sign up online, go to our website, sign up for formed. You're one of my uh, parishioners emeritus, so you can sign up on our website. Jody, hello. And Marie, Kegi, Shudi, how, I hope you and the kids are doing well. First time I've ever heard that evangelists needed more lawyers. Here, here, are you kidding me? Lawyers, we fail because we have a great calling and the calling is justice. And the problem is when you have a calling that is that important, how easy is it to fail? That's why people get frustrated with lawyers. But it's a noble profession if you're a person who is trying to do justice, a great profession. Roberta, good information, but I hope also it's more than just information, but a sense of a challenge to what the, our faith life is um, and how it is that love grows in our life. Um, Jen, God bless you. Great leader of our moms group. Um, you know, uh, it's the sense of that you can make yourself happy. I think happiness ensues from a whole lifetime of good decision making in a good sense of what God looks like in your life. Um, Tom Garcia, thank you, Tom. Uh, Kissy Faye, hello uh, to you too. Well, here's the thing. So this is bringing to a close um, 30 Days of Mary, and I really enjoyed it because I love our Blessed Lady, and it's great talking about her. I always feel like when I talk about her, I never do justice to her. How can you do justice to her? But the, the, if, what it does is open you up to prayer and thinking about these things that somehow in all of this is for you, that Jesus, God the Father sends Jesus for you to help you to think about your life in a way that will go to heaven. And so um, that, if you think about that and let that permeate, it will just change how you look at the world and the commitments that you make. So I'm going to take next week off, so we're not going to do theology on tap next week. But I think we'll return in the second week of June. I think that's right, the second week of June, for one or two June sessions at least, where we're going to take on controversial um, things in the church. And one of the things I really want to talk about is, is the Pope an idol worshiper? Because if you listen to these crazy fights out there, um, the way that they go after this guy, and uh, to just talk about what's happening in the Va uh, Vatican, and to also, I hope, direct you um, to some great places to read responsible journalism so you understand what's happening with the Curia. Um, I say when they raid some Monsignor's apartment over there and arrest everybody in there, that's not a sad thing. That's a good thing. It's like child molesters, you know, uh, celibate guys who want to pretend to be celibate priests but do horrible things. When they're arrested, that's not a bad thing. It's a bad thing if they're underground. It's a good thing when they're arrested. So when we talk about what's happening internationally in the church, especially as we're expecting this McCarrick report, it's really about uh, being able to discern the signs of the times and what's really happening. It really hurt me that I had one of my moms who thought the Pope might be an idol worshiper. I just went, you know, crazy. You can't be more Catholic than the Pope. You just can't. Um, so we'll talk about that, and we'll uh, do some announcements about it so you know what it is. And so, um, Patrick, it's good.
Thanks for listening and letting me share by, uh, our church's faith with you. And misuk, wine and kimchi, sounds like a wonderful combination. So anyway, God bless you. And uh, maybe if we don't see you this weekend for Mass, which is understandable, uh, still, let's keep exploring how it is that you can practice your faith with your family at home. Just because we're not getting together on weekends doesn't mean your relationship with Christ shouldn't grow. And remember what uh, St. Louis de Montfort said, to Jesus through Mary, because Mary opens doors for us just in how we think about how God in our life. So let me leave you with this blessing. The Lord be with you. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. God bless you, and I'll see you probably in two weeks if the creek don't rise.